So a massive huge welcome to everyone here, um, especially all of our local uh, partners, uh, change makers, leaders who came from 22 countries uh, to be with us for um, this event and to share their views uh, on how we can further advance locally led development um, and local conflict prevention and peace building. So a massive shout out to everyone who's traveled. Uh, thank you so much for making the time. Um, my name is Sahar Tabaja. I lead the Peace, Stability and Transition Practice at Chemonix. Um, and uh, uh, the PST team, uh, in collaboration with multiple other teams at Chemonix, um, sort of conceived of this event about uh, a year and a half ago when we were looking around um, a lot of the forums discussing how to advance LLD localization and realizing that there weren't a lot, a lot of local voices around that table. Um, and we thought, okay, this is a conversation that really needs to happen with our local partners. Um, and here we are uh, a year later. So we are super, super excited uh, to have you all here and to be kicking off the next two days. As you uh, have seen from the agenda, uh, we are um, uh, starting off with a keynote address um, from a very uh, special person who I'll introduce shortly. Um, uh, and then we are moving to a headline panel of the first day um, to discuss our big question for today, which is if we are really committed to shifting the power, what does that look like in practice? What does it look like to really put local uh, 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 leaders and partners in the lead uh, in the development process? Um, we'll then move on to a coffee break and then we will uh, uh, reassemble in smaller groups uh, for facilitated in-depth discussions. Uh, there also, obviously, we're applying Chatham House rules. We have a framework that will suggest for how to go about that discussion, um, but it's really just to enable us to have, uh, you know, uh, um, converse really meaningful and useful conversations that we can um, uh, advance, use to advance uh, this discussion in DC and, and elsewhere. Um, we will then head to lunch at 1.30, um, and at 2.30 we all head uh, out to a networking session, which will be here in the atrium and downstairs, and it will be divided by region uh, and by technical sector. So there will be signs that are, say, you know, Latin America and the Caribbean, MENA, and so on, uh, just so people can find others from that region who they're interested in talking to, but we also will have technical sectors so that you also find folks across regions um, that you'd like to talk to and, and connect with. Um, finally, thank you again for being here, everyone. Um, this is an event that is really very dear to our hearts. It's a topic that I know is, is crucial for everyone. Uh, we live it, we work on it daily. We all are in this sector and in this industry because we want to make a difference. Um, we want to see meaningful change happen in our countries, in the communities that we work with, in our adopted countries as well. So um, please, you know, uh, leverage this opportunity, make the most of it to connect with everyone, um, but also to uh, share your valuable experiences and insights um, um, because it, it will uh, make a difference uh, to how we all think about this collectively and, and uh, how we move next. Um, all right, so our, uh, I'll move on. Our first uh, address is uh, by Fernando. And Fernando uh, uh, Calado Bryce is a, a Camonics colleague, um, but also a local leader in his own right uh, in his native Colombia. He's a migration and human rights expert with over 20 years of experience um, managing. Uh, really complex programs and, and uh, over 15 years of implementation in uh, Colombia. Uh, Fernando has a special career arc, which we think really sort of resemble, um, speaks to the, the interaction of the world and the stakeholders that we're bringing together here today. Fernando was, uh, uh, you know, an activist and leader in his own country. Uh, he was working on these issues locally. He was working with international implementing partners and donors. And uh, now, in addition to managing the very complex um, uh, uh, refugee uh, immigration response, uh, Venezuela, sorry, VRI, Venezuelan 
re response initiative. <laughs> Um, he is also a, a board member uh, of uh, Chemonix um, International. Um, Fernando has been a three-time chief of party for USAID-funded programs and um, is currently serving as the IDIQ manager and chief of party for VRI. Um, and uh, he previously led the human rights activity and the human rights program. Um, and served as director of programs for IOM uh, in Bogota. Uh, where he oversaw a large portfolio uh, uh, of uh, projects to support human rights for migrants and other vulnerable populations. Um, Fernando is also a marathon runner. So for other runners in this room, <laughs> if you want to discuss or compare times, go ahead. I cannot run to save my life, so <laughs> uh, we'll be talking about uh, uh, migration and a lot of other uh, uh, topics, but I think the reason we asked Fernando to give the keynote address is that he, he has, you know, he sits within this sort of Venn diagram of all these uh, uh, different stakeholders that are key uh, to advancing locally led development and leadership. Um, so without further ado, Fernando. Thank you so much. Um, I if I would have paid attention to the instructions, I would have prepared this in Spanish and delivered it in Spanish, but you will have to deal with my Peruvian English um, because I didn't read the instructions. So thank you so much. Thanks so much for inviting me. This is a great venue, having 40 partners from all over the world. Um, I think it shows how Chemonix is really interested in discussing localization, being able to invest in this initiative that USAID is taking very seriously, and it's a testament of how um, we try to address problems by uh, putting uh, local leaders and local groups in the driver's seat. Um, I have always considered myself an optimist, but a realist optimist. Um, I look at the hard facts with optimism, but I don't avoid them. For example, my national soccer team, Peru, is really bad. Uh, but still, I think it's going to qualify for the World Cup as root for them. So identifying that fact, but uh, never losing optimism, uh, I'm sure will take the team to the next World Cup. Um, in terms of the development front, again, on this, um, realistic optimism. Um, I think we are in, in a moment where we need to understand how localization can help us to address the big challenges that we have. Um, in the countries where we all come from, we have aggravated uh, challenges from the rest of the world. We have uh, first uh, one big challenge, which is see how we can continue recovering from the pandemic. The pandemic has hit hard on all the world, but particularly hard in fragile and conflict-affected countries. There has been a recovery over the last years for the majority of the world, but unfortunately, in conflict-affected countries and fragile countries, that recovery has not uh, been at the speed uh, that it's necessary to go back to the levels of development pre-pandemic. Um, that, what does that mean? Economically, what uh, we are seeing is the, according to several research and investigations and World Bank figures, the capacity of investment of governments has go back to levels of 2010, which is critical. That means that we have to come back from the pandemic, but with less resources and less capacity to move forward. That is one of the big challenges that we have to address. The second is climate change. Climate change, on top of the economic hardness, climate change, as we have seen in the last months and uh, years, have started to impact uh, more strongly. More strongly, and climate change has unleashed devastating effects through rising global temperatures and changes in natural cycle of ecosystems, threatening use and, ability, and habitability of land, food security, 
and the survival of nearly 40% of the world population, according to Yen figures. Third, there is a big challenge that overrides, or it's an umbrella uh, in order to move forward to addressing climate change and the pandemic and economic recovery, which is democracy, the state of democracy, the state of governance in the world. Right now, as we speak, most of the people live in a state that it's not fully democratic. According to figures of Open Society and others, 60% of the population of the world live in places where there is no full democracy. If we want to move forward in terms of recovery of economic and in terms of climate change addressing, we need to protect democracy and try to ensure to expand the capacity of democracy to have the citizens leading their processes in their countries and being able to have a voice in how to address these challenges. Because these challenges need to be addressed in a way where citizens can decide what is the priority and the sequences of the intervention. This is a global agenda, but it needs to be localized. And the first participation or aspect of participation that uh, we need to focus is to help countries identify what is the level of priority in terms of their challenges and how they want to sequence the intervention on this. It's not the same for some countries to address an urgent priority, which is achieve peace and stability and uh, address climate change at the same time. Can they do it at the same time? Can they do it together? Or they need to sequence the interventions that they will be doing in terms of trying to uh, work on that. But in terms of how can we, like-minded actors, address th these three major challenges in the context where traditional development mechanisms are changing? The answer to these questions can be given by those who know the problems of the communities better than anyone else, which is you all. Along these lines, USAID proposed to strengthen locally-led development by aligning goals and partners through inclusive and adaptive leadership as a key strategy to empower local actors in partnership with governments, international institutions, and private sector to lead change in their own communities through their voices and visions to advance sustainable development on the issues that matter the most. How to promote the strategy of localization? The question that we will try to address here. According to USAID, localization is thus understood as a method or set of internal reforms, actions, and behavioral changes that USAID and the international community understands, undertakes to ensure that our work puts local actors in the driver's seat, strengthen local systems, and is responsive to local communities, both in terms of humanitarian assistance and official development assistance. This is why the gathering of more than 40 partners here is key to transforming our experience into a global impact strategy. This vision implies in moving beyond the mere design and implementation of programs with fixed results to a new vision based on the co-creation and strengthening of local systems as a strategy to move towards sustainable local development models. It also encouraged international development experts to design and implement projects with results aimed at strengthening local systems that contribute to sustainable and inclusive development of communities. The investments made in these local actors, be they governments, institutions, civic organizations or individuals, should be in line with their capacity to deliver sustainable results. Thus, by 30, 2030, USAID has um, set a target of having 50% of its resources devoted to co-creation exercises, project implementation, and evaluation of their impact on local communities. Well, in the words of our CEO, Jamie Butcher, Chemonics see this as a business strategy that we have been implementing for more than 50 years. And that is why we are here today in this room with more than 40 testimonies on how we do it. In the case of Colombia, where I'm currently working, the dire humanitarian situation have produced, in Venezuela has produced a migration flow that led to three million Venezuelans to settle in the main cities in Colombia. Urban migration management, like the complex challenges we are discussing today, is not an exclusive process of local administrations, but involves multiple actors in local systems that include civil society actors. 
in order to promote access of migrants, returnees and host populations to quality services and to effectively influence policies for their integration, it is necessary to provide them with technical assistance for comprehensive strengthening. For this reason, Chemonix, with the support and funding of USAID, is implementing through the Integra project, aiming at integrating migrants that, and have recognized that civil society organizations, grassroots community organizations, and community action committees are allies and key players in these local systems. And on this process of working with civil society, I would like to share with you three key lessons that we have learned during the past three years of implementation. First, in working and strengthening civil society and local organizations, we need to work in an area which is try to implement activism with pragmatism. How does, do we do it and what does this mean? To work effectively with local actors, we need to understand not only the local system, but also their own ethos. What are these local organizations trying to achieve and not try to impose what we think they should achieve as a local organization? In fact, these knowledge exercises lead to self-reflective environments that allow the organization itself to begin to visualize where it comes from and what are the practices that may take to immune to change international actors should provide a platform to transform their capacity for community organizing into projects and programs that benefit the community. At this point, the use of input measurements and self-diagnostic tools allow them to take ownership of this process and build works planned and to strengthen themselves. On this first process, what we have been trying to do is try to identify where this organization wants to go and try to adapt the tools that USAID have and others in order to make sure that they can align their vision with what they can pragmatically achieve in terms of trying to transform their communities. A lot of times what we see is a big vision but lack of clarity of what that means in terms of translating this into work plans and actions that can make small chiefs transformations and then move forward and change their communities. Evidence-based decision making and social monetization of data. That is another big area where we have been trying to work and we are currently working with civil society organizations. Civil society organizations have these strong powers that they have the knowledge of their communities and they know where the people are and what they need. How can we transform that into systemic uh, knowledge that can become data that they can socially monetize. Companies, Uber uh, and other platforms are monetizing their data in order to make uh, lots of money. Here what we are talking about is how these um, civil society organizations can monetize that data for impact. Uh, an example of this element is we so three million Venezuelans came into Colombia. Nobody knew where they were in the cities. And there were these civil society organizations of Venezuelans um, working and trying to organize themselves around to see how they can um, start accessing services that they need. Uh, we work with them. We identify those organizations. And we start uh, transferring tools of data collection and um, systematization so they came up uh, with maps of where these groups of Venezuelans were in these cities. We managed to prioritize and identify where the 10 uh, hotspots in each of these cities were. And that allowed to inform the government on where to start uh, implementing. Of course, we crossed this data with government data. And that allowed us to have a very powerful maps that were allowed to guide the intervention for the government, but also for civil society. And now civil societies, these organizations are working with this data that it's uh, completely theirs in terms of uh, moving forward on identifying funds to be able to work with the community. So they are monetizing data to bring impact, but in a systematic way. Not only but having qualitative data, but also quantitative data that can allow them to georeference the intervention. 
cultivating new leadership and development uh, and developing succession plans. Um, the author Jim Collins, in his book Good to Great, which is a very uh, entrepreneurial and uh, private sector uh, book, but it's good, says that a great vision without great people is irrelevant. What we have identified and what we are trying to work with local organizations through a strengthening program is to see, and usually what happens is that there are a very strong leader with a very strong vision, but he doesn't have a team and association plan. If that person leaves, there's nobody to replace him and the organization will probably suffer a big setback or will disappear. What we're trying to work is to work with them to identify who is going to be the replacement of this big leader or these persons, and how that can be done in a way that it's realistic. We cannot pretend that uh, we are in a company where we can have association plan and the money to have a replacement of whoever when they leave. This needs to be identified and adapted to the reality of the organization and be able to come up with a plan that will allow to have this replacement in terms of leadership. Finally, another important element that we have identified in trying to put local leaders and local organizations uh, at, the, at the front and leading these efforts is to build uh, exchange knowledge, uh, exchange of knowledge networks. What we are uh, looking is that the ability to put all these brains and all this energy together and all this leadership at the local level in uh, knowledge networks allow first to uh, understand that they are not alone, which is very important. Uh, most of the local organization thinks that they are alone in their quest for uh, their vision, but discussing and talking with peers, which is what we are going to do here to today and tomorrow, um, it's fundamental in terms of gaining energy and motivation. Secondly, we can understand that the challenges are common and identify what are the practices and how they can address with limited resources the big challenges that they have. And thirdly, and very important, it creates and it expands the social fabric looking for change and addressing uh, these uh, big topics that we have at hand. But how do we increase the speed and scale of these efforts? How do we move from a handful of examples to a comprehensive strategy that achieves at, global scale, at a global scale an impact to reach um, the development goals that we have traced? Uh, there is no one-size-fits-all approach to organizational development. From our perspective and experience in strengthening organizations in Colombia, we emphasize the importance of adapting strategies, tools, and resources to each context and organization. In this spirit, we at Chemonix International reaffirm our commit commitment to be catalysts for these changes with humility and intention and to continue to co-create on the local level a more stable, prosperous, equitable and inclusive world. We hope that today we can mobilize our knowledge to answer the questions of the day. What does it look to put local partners and change makers in the lead? Thank you so much.